Hi everyone. I hope this video finds you well. Uh, I hope this sermon finds you well. And um, no matter what you're going through, I hope you are doing well. It is once again my pleasure to be able to preach the word of God before you all once again. And actually, I already recorded the sermon once, but I found that uh, that my camera didn't actually record it uh, for whatever reason. So here I am doing it again, and I trust that God uh, would bless um, this sermon. Though we cannot physically be together at this time, we trust that God has a good purpose and plan in light of all that is going on. So as we come before the word of God, I pray that we be able to focus and be able to love his word and be reassured, especially during these difficult times that we find ourselves in. Allow me to just pray before we begin. Father, we thank you for this day and for your sovereignty over our lives. Indeed, you are our God. And from everlasting to everlasting, you remain God. And it is, no, it is no burden for us to come before your word once again. It is a great privilege for us to come to your word, to hear from your word, and to study your word. As we come and approach the Gospel of John in chapter 12, I pray that you would bless our time in the word, that you would help us to see, first and foremost, the greatness and beauty of Christ himself. Help us to see what a correct response should look like towards Christ. And I pray that our lives would be worthy of the calling that you have given us. We don't want to waste our lives. We don't want to waste our time. So I pray, God, that you would help us. We thank you that we can approach you, God, and have a right relationship with you because of Christ and what he has done for us on the cross. Would you stir our affections for Christ? Would you help us to grow in greater love for this Christ? He has done a great thing for us. Father, um, we acknowledge that we may be bringing many things uh, before you right now, many distractions, many worries, many anxieties, uh, the worries of this world, of this life. And I just pray you help us to set our minds on things above right now. Help us to not worry. Help us to have a clear mind uh, so that we may be able to understand your word. Would your spirit help us to understand and perceive the truths of your word now. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. As you know, um, I am continuing on in our sermon series in the Gospel of John. And today, we find ourselves in John chapter 12, verse 1 to 8. So if you have your Bible, I hope that you can um, turn to it and, and read along with me and follow along as I go throughout the passage. Before uh, I begin and before I get into chapter 12, let me just give a, a quick recap of sorts uh, that leads us up to chapter 12. Previously in chapter 11, we saw the final sign from Christ in the Gospel of John. Chapter 11 was amazing in that we saw the power of Christ in bringing Lazarus back to life. Lazarus at that point was already dead for four days. With no hope of resuscitation in the eyes of the Jews, Lazarus, as far as everyone else was concerned, was dead. And he would stay dead. It's been four days. However, Christ indeed is the Messiah the Son of God, the Lord of all. He claimed to be the resurrection and life, and all, and all who believe in him will have eternal life, though they die. The claims that Jesus makes about himself, about the eternal life in him, are radical claims, as you know. Yet the first half of the book of John shows these miraculous signs that verify these radical claims of Christ. The final sign of bringing Lazarus back to life not only shows the power and deity of Christ, but the rest of chapter 11 shows that in order for Christ to truly bring eternal life to his people, he must also die to bring life. Furthermore, in chapter 11, verses 51 to 52, Caiaphas prophesied that Jesus would die for the nations and for all those scattered abroad. Even if Caiaphas was not a believer at that point, God still used him to prophesy about Christ, showing that Christ, that Jesus' death was imminent. 
So in a sense, this last sign that is recorded of here, of Jesus in John, sets the tone for the second half of the book. It sets in motion the path to Christ's death as leaders now plan to have Christ killed. Yes, Jesus has done a great miracle in bringing someone back to life, displaying the power and affirming his words, affirming his power and affirming his words. Yet this great last miracle in John is used by God to set in motion the human decree to kill Jesus. As we think back to chapter 11, indeed Christ is amazing and marvelous as he shows great power over life in bringing Lazarus back from the dead after four days. That is a great and marvelous thing that Christ has just done. Yet we must keep in mind the death of Christ was now drawing near. This is some of the context we find ourselves in before our passage in chapter 12. Chapter 12 is the last chapter before the third section of this book, which highlights the farewell discourse and Johannian passion account. So think about that context and remember that context as we approach our text. And allow me to read for you our text today in uh, John chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. Martha therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume, but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief, and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. I want us to feel the gravity of the events happening here in chapter 12. Throughout our time in John so far, we have seen great miracles of Christ already, and also great teaching of Christ. We just saw the final miracle of Christ, raising someone to life. Christ is the resurrection and life. Yet from chapters 13 to 20, the book no longer covers his miracles, but the path to his death. The king of glory has humbled himself and is on his way to die after doing such amazing things on earth, such as bringing someone back to life. And here in our passage, in light of all Christ has done and already taught, we find Christ in Bethany six days before the Passover, having dinner, with his, uh, having dinner before his triumphal entry into Jerusalem to ultimately die. And at this dinner, we see three unique attitudes and responses. These three responses will be my simple outline for today. First, we see a response of devotion, verse 2 to 3. Second, we see a response of rejection, verse 4 to 6. And lastly, we see a response from Christ, verse 7 to 8. This brings us to our first point, a response of devotion, verse 2 to 3. Just a chapter earlier, we saw Mary at Jesus' feet, weeping, saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Perhaps at this point in chapter 11, Mary did not understand that Jesus, what Jesus was about to do. He was about to do something amazing. Even though it was acknowledged that he was the resurrection and life, however, in our passage, there should be no mistake. Mary, a little while ago, was weeping over her dead brother, Lazarus. But witness the amazing miracle of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, verifying everything Jesus said about life and resurrection to be true, verifying his power and might over life. Lazarus was now literally sitting at the table with all of them, living, eating, talking. Imagine the joy and amazement in Mary's heart. On top of that, it was six days before the Passover, a significant time for the Jews. During Passover, the Jews remembered the power and protection of God. 
through, through the sacrifice and blood of a lamb, the wrath of God would pass, all, would pass over all who were covered by the blood on the doorpost. All who did not have the blood of the lamb would face judgment and the death of the firstborn son. We can read back on that in Exodus. An amazing story, an amazing story of deliverance from God through the blood of a lamb. The power of Christ displayed and, and the celebration of Passover were all fresh, no doubt, in the minds of those at dinner. Perhaps Mary did not f yet fully understand this yet, but Christ himself, the Messiah, the Son of God, the true Passover lamb who would die and divert the wrath of God onto himself was sitting in front of her. Feel the wonder and greatness of the scene. Something that Mary did not yet un fully understand yet, perhaps. Yet we definitely do see that Mary did have enough understanding to know of the significance of Christ. No mere man brings someone back to life. No mere man turn wa turns water to wine, heals, feeds 5,000, walks on water, or restores sight to someone born blind. No one does that. No one, no one can do that. But Christ did. And Christ was a resurrection and life. Clearly, there are eschatological implications for Christ being here on earth now. Good news has come, and Mary must have seen at least some of this because of what she goes on to do in our passage. Mary, after perhaps being so amazed and humbled by the work of Christ, displays her devotion and humility towards Christ in our passage. She first takes a pound of expensive ointment made of pure nard and anoints Jesus' feet. So ointment, according to Jesus, uh, according to Judas what himself later on, was worth at least a year's wages. This was an expensive perfume. A year of salary, if not more, was being used up all at once, most likely on Jesus himself. Definitely, this was no cheap ointment. In fact, the whole house is said to be filled with a fragrance of perfume. Author Daryl Bach notes how good oil is diffused from the bedchamber to the dining hall. So this was indeed a good perfume, costly, precious, since its fragrance moved throughout the whole house. Everyone could smell it. And yes, Mary does a great thing by giving and using such expensive elements on Christ. But don't you see, Christ is worthy of our all. Christ is more valuable and more precious than anything money could ever buy. Mary, yes, no doubt understands how much money she is losing, but she seems to understand how much she is actually gaining in her being devoted to Christ. In verse 3, we not only see Mary use something costly and valuable on Christ, but she then proceeds to wipe the feet of Christ with her hair. An act of clear love and devotion to Christ. Indeed, as one author notes, the work of cleaning feet or stooping to the level of Mary was the work of a servant. Yet I'm sure most servants did not clean their master's feet with their hair. It's not every day you see someone of some repute kneel before someone's feet and wipe it with their hair. Mary saw what Christ did. She heard his words. He is indeed the resurrection and life. Christ is worthy of all her love, all her devotion, and all her service. No doubt, the heart of Mary is in the right place. The heart of Mary has been melted by the great work and words of Christ himself. So of course, Mary's act of devotion and service is great. But the person whom she is serving and devoting herself is even greater. Christ is worthy of this. Christ is the ultimate Passover lamb. Christ is the Messiah, God's anointed one. God is, the one. God is not necessarily impressed by all the gifts and acts of service that we do for him. But where is our posture of heart today? Where is our posture of heart before God, before Christ? In our own hearts, do we see Christ as beautiful? And worthy of all the devotion and service? 
Is He the Lord and Savior of our lives? There is no one else in all the universe more worthy of our hearts today, especially on this side of the cross. There's nobody as worthy as Christ. As we move on in our narrative, we come to verses 4 to 6 and to our second point. First, we see the heart of Mary towards Christ. But now, we see a response of rejection from Judas towards Mary and ultimately towards Christ. A response of rejection. No doubt that Judas was aware, if not usually, a, not usually present for all the teaching and miracles of Christ. He was usually, he was probably always there. He witnessed Christ. But as mentioned already, Christ literally just raised someone from the dead. We have already seen such, great, uh, such a great miracle from Christ. Yet we see a picture of a heart that is cold towards Christ. A heart that is hardened towards Christ. A heart that rejects Christ. Brothers and sisters, it is not impossible to witness the greatness of Christ, to see his miracles and his mighty work, yet to reject him and completely misunderstand him. The things of this world are deceiving. The treasures of this world can be dangerous. It is more than possible to see the treasures of this world and to love it more than the greatest treasure of all in Christ. Christ himself. Judas, as Jesus' disciple, questions Mary and her acts of devotion. He asks why she didn't sell the ointment and give it to the poor. Wouldn't that have been a better act of service? Wouldn't that have been a better use of money and resource? But of course, Judas misses the point. Mary has done a beautiful thing to Christ. Yet all he can think about is money. Ultimately, as verse 6 says, Judas didn't even care about the poor. Instead, he was a thief. He would have stolen the money that was supposed to go to the poor, most likely. He was a thief. Judas, in light of all Christ did, in light of the beautiful act of service Mary just performed, responds with rejection and with a hardened heart. Didn't Judas see that the Lord of Lords and King of Kings was in his presence? Didn't he see that the long foretold Son of Man, worthy of all power and dominion, was in front of him? God in the flesh. The Word of God made known. The presence of God no longer in human tents, but now in the very person of Jesus Christ himself. God with us. Do you see that yourself? Do you, or do you remain in a state of rejection and unbelief, brothers and sisters? Fulfillment in Christ has literally been happening before Judas's eyes. Yet all he can think about is money. All he sees from the act of Mary is lost money. How can that be all you think about when you are looking at Christ? Brothers and sisters, don't miss the big picture in John's gospel. Don't miss Christ. Not too long ago, I was in Arizona with a few other people. As many of you know, Arizona is home to some of the most beautiful natural wonders of the world, including the Grand Canyon. One day, my group and I decided to make the trip up to Grand Canyon, of course, and we wanted to see this amazing wonder of the world. When we got there, the canyon, we saw that the canyon was actually larger than life, so large that you have to take multiple buses to, to multiple locations of the canyon to see the different parts of the canyon. Yet, while being at the Grand Canyon it, and while seeing its beauty, all some people could think about was when we could go back to the hotel. All, the, all some people could think about was going back to the hotel so that they could relax. They were in front of the Grand Canyon, one of the most amazing things in this world, larger than life, yet all some people could think about was going back to the hotel. Instead of focusing on the Grand Canyon, some of us were simply content to think about the hotel we were staying at rather than taking in something that we may never see again. We don't know when we're going to be back here. We were in Arizona. Arizona is so much more than a hotel, but some of us miss that big picture. In our passage today, Jesus Christ is before Judas. Eternal life himself is present. Christ is physically there with his disciples, and he won't always be physically around. 
Yet all Judas could think about was the lost money that came from Mary's act of devotion. All he could think about was the temporary joy that could be found with something as temporary as money. Judas missed the big picture of Christ himself. Christ was there. Christ was present. Christ is worthy. Yet he missed that. Instead, he thought about money. When we think about our own lives, are we missing the big picture of Christ? On this side of the cross, we have no excuse. Christ has already died and resurrected. He is the Lord of life. Yet when we consider him and his word, do we misunderstand? Do we reject him? Do we think and devote ourselves to things that are worth infinitely less? Is the mission of Christ, his death and resurrection, lost to our minds and lost to our hearts? I pray that it would not be so. Now we come to our third point, which highlights a response from Christ in verse 7 to 8. In his response, we see that Jesus stands up for Mary despite Judas' words. And he also sets the tone for the rest of his time on earth. The focus is no longer on Jesus' signs and miracles. The scenes and mood are now turning, shifting to Christ and his road to the cross. It is clear when Jesus tells Judas, leave her alone, that Judas was in the wrong. Mary has just performed a beautiful act of devotion, displaying humility and love towards Christ. Though Mary's act is not prescriptive, it, is defini it definitely displays a heart that is pleasing towards Christ. Mary was able to focus on Christ and respond correctly towards Christ, whereas Judas misses the point and is more obsessed with money and the things of this world than Christ himself. In verse 7, we also see the purpose for which Judas was to leave Mary alone. Whether Mary knew it or not, her actions were highly significant because of what it, it foreshadowed. Indeed, the act of anointing Christ is directly linked to the coming burial and death of Christ. Author and teacher Daryl Bach again notes how Mary has kept this perfume for this special act, which in turn prepares Christ for his burial. So this perfume, this anointing signifies something that was to come. Jesus is getting ready, and I believe getting us ready for his imminent death. Therefore, Judas is told to leave Mary alone because this anointing of Jesus is serving a purpose. The perfume was meant and saved for Christ. It was never meant to be sold for money. So here, the burial, the coming death of Christ is clearly on display for us as readers to take in and remember. Jesus is again the resurrection and the life. He is the Messiah. He is worthy. But part of what this means is that he as the anointed one would die to bring us life. He must die. Then our passage ends in verse 8 with Christ saying, For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. Christ here is not denying our obligation to those, to those in our community and to the poor. Rather, he concedes this truth about the poor and pushes forward the more pressing truth of how you will not always have me. In fact, this point of not always having Christ is the reason for why Judas is to leave her alone. Judas must leave Mary alone. Christ is on his way to die. Then he will eventually ascend back to heaven. These are some of the last moments that they will ever have with Christ before he dies. Therefore, leave Mary alone. Therefore, let her pour out this perfume on Christ. This anointing is for Christ. Christ is with you now. There is definitely much to do when Christ leaves, yes. There is, yes, a great mission at hand. But Christ is still here. So I believe the main point here is on Christ. On his presence, on his mission, on his worthiness. We do well to remember that the book of John was written so that we and many would believe in Christ alone and have eternal life. So as we read this passage, don't miss the importance of what Christ is talking about. The beauty of Christ 
of Christ's response once again shows the great lengths he would ultimately go through for our redemption. Christ is worthy of all our devotion. He is worthy of all our loyalty and worthy of all of our love. So brothers and sisters, as I end, allow me to just challenge you one more time. Do you see the goodness of Christ here? Jesus himself is an all-sovereign, all-knowing, all-powerful Lord and God. Though in our passage, there is still time before his actual death and resurrection, he has already said it in his own heart. It has already been set in stone that Jesus, that he, would be buried. Chapter 19 regarding Jesus' burial was a sure deal. We are the creatures created by God for fellowship with Him. And yet we are also the sinners. We are the evil ones who have rebelled against this God. However, here in our passage, we see the gospel in motion. Jesus Christ was sent to earth to die, to be buried. And He did, and he did do this. He lived the life we, were so, we should have lived. And He died the death that we should have died on the cross. Yet three days later, he rose again, defeating sin and death. So do you see the greatness of Christ here? Believe in this Christ. Trust in Him. And you can be forgiven of all your sin and restored to right relationship and fellowship with Christ, with God once again. And have everlasting joy. Christ was no coward. He was no liar. He came to achieve His goal. So brothers and sisters, let's never forget these truths of His death and burial, of his commitment to redeem all who trust in him through dying and resurrection. Jesus Christ indeed is the re resurrection and life, and he would achieve this through first dying and being buried. So may you see Christ as all worthy of your love. May you see Christ as all worthy of your devotion, of your service, and of your life. Does Christ have your heart? Does Christ have your life, or, or are you looking to other things? Christ is worthy. Christ is here. Christ is for us. And we can look to him, to his death, to his resurrection, and to the everlasting life that we have in him for our hope and security day after day. I pray that this may be so for you. Allow me to pray to end us all. Indeed, Father, we are well reminded in your passage of the greatness and um, worthiness of Christ. Christ is the worthy one. He is uh, the anointed one. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. He is the Son of Man, worthy of all dominion and power. So, Father, as we ponder on Christ, as we think about this Christ, I pray that our affections once again would be stirred for this Christ, that we would grow in a greater love for this Christ. Would we be fully devoted to this Christ in our life? And ha as we have been well reminded that Christ indeed was buried and he was indeed put to death and he did indeed resurrect. Therefore, Christ is worthy of our life and he is worthy of all our allegiance and devotion. And I pray that that would be true in our own lives. That we would love Christ above all things. And that we would see the things of this earth, such as money, even things like family and possession, and our houses, our cars, all our stuff. Would it be nothing compared to the greatness of Christ? Do this in our hearts. Do this in our minds. There are so many distractions in this world competing for our attention. But would we see the greatness of Christ over and above all the things in this world? Make that true in our lives today and be with us in the coming week. Um, whether we go to work, whether we spend time at home, whatever we have to do, would you establish the work of, work of our hands and help us to know that you indeed are near. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi everyone. I have a brief announcement to share with you. Last week was our final Christian Ed class in 1 John. 
I think it was a great class, but unfortunately our numbers, our attendance was a little bit disappointing. So I really want to encourage you to join the class starting today. As you know, we have that vision, vision statement that we've been talking about to become a missional community, seizing every opportunity to share the gospel. We've been looking at what that means over the past year or two. Well, now we're going to be outlaying a class across every congregation in our two locations to try to get us as a church thinking and grappling with what changes we might need to put in place to become more missional. Um, this class is going to be interesting because um, there's going to be a lot of different teachers. Actually, I'll start off and I'll teach four lessons, two of which are standardized across all of our congregations, two of which will look more at our particular um, our particular situation, and we'll be able to look at uh, what it might mean to be more missional in times such as this with the pandemic raging. So I think that'll be an interesting and challenging class. And then after that, actually, we've invited for eight weeks um, missionaries from OMF. It's uh, Overseas Missionary Fellowship, which used to be China Inland Mission, started by Hudson Taylor. Well, <clears throat> they're going to come to us and share some of their unique perspectives with their backgrounds as missionaries on what it might look like to be more missional as a church here in Canada and in Toronto. So um, I think it's going to be a very interesting class. It's an important class. We're inviting all of the congregations to take it. It's our turn right now. So I really strongly want to recommend make the time. It starts today at 1130. The link for the Zoom class will be in the email you received. Make time. Plan to join it over the next 12 weeks. Let's learn together what it looks like to be a missional church. Thank you.